And yeah. feel free to repeat yourself if if you mentioned any of this on um, the majority of the report this afternoon. Yeah, I guess the main thing that most people are concerned about is uh, just, you know, the Senate race, because, I mean, that has the greatest implications uh, as far as trying to get a progressive in there. Uh, you know, Barbara Lee would have been great. I, I What I said on the air was that, uh, you know, Barbara Lee was, you know, they'd split the left vote, essentially. I mean, you can make, you can quibble with, you know, is Katie Porter really a leftist or is she more of a, you know, center left candidate? I'd probably say she's more center left, but I mean, she's still much better than most uh, Democratic candidates. And especially since she's running in Orange County, which is very conservative. And that was a Republican area for, you know, most of the 21st century. And so, uh, but, you know, they just did not do well at all. Like I said on the air, they were seven. If you would put their the combination of their totals, they were still seven points away from Steve Garvey's total. And so, yeah, that was that was pretty rough to, to deal with that because I thought that both of them would do a lot better, um, especially Katie Porter. But you, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say one thing that wasn't too rough was Sam wasn't as bent out of shape this time about you coming on this show as he was the last time you mentioned it. He seemed like he was upset and this time he didn't, but I thought I could detect maybe he was like an undercurrent. Did you pick that up on, pick up on that at all? A little bit. I, I did say in a, in a private message to him that, you know, I was, <laughs> I mean, I know it's a, it's a big, you know, running joke to him, you know, maybe. but, uh, yeah, no, it is. But uh, <laughs> but I'm saying like, you know, you know that I've been calling into the show, you know, for 10 years. And so it's like, you know, I mean, I mean, I really enjoy these shows also. But I mean, it's like, you know, I'd still be calling in, you know, yeah, yeah. and so 10 years. That's a yeah. commitment. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. I mean, I always love doing that. I mean, it's I love politics, love to see the world try to get better. Uh, and, uh, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that'll happen. This has been a rough year for progressives. Boy. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping all the, all the people, um, that are running are going to, uh, you know, the, the, the incumbents, I think that's what most progressives are focused on. The first one is summer Lee's, uh, race on the 23rd of April. And then, you know, you're dealing with all the other ones, uh, Jamal Bowman, uh, I mean, C Corey Bush, uh, Ilhan Omar, those are going to be the toughest holds. I think the other the other members are going to be pretty easy holds. But there's just, you know, not too many people, you know, like like Jen Perlman, she's running. She's great. You know, I've, I've heard her interviewed. I'm glad you're interviewing her. I like her her outlook on life, you know, she's got a, I like her, the issues that she focuses on. I know that primary is, uh, I think it's in August, uh, around mm -hmm. 20, 20, 20th, around that area. I don't know the, I think it'd be, I'm not sure. I, I think you're right. Date. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, but besides her, I mean, if people want to DM me, <laughs> you know, to, to, to let me aware of other progressive candidates, there really aren't that many that are running, well, you know, so. so let's talk about who these folks are going up against, because um, APAC is specifically targeting some of the candidates that you mentioned, Jamal Bowman. Yeah. Uh, he's under fire for the incident in which he pulled a Capitol Hill fire alarm. Right. But right. he's also facing a popular Westchester County executive um, named George Latimer. Right. But I guess that's a big deal there. Um, Corey Bush is under a federal investigation for alleged campaign finance violations. She's being challenged by public defender Wesley Bell. Um, yes. You know, everyone's kind of shaking in their boots over that as well. Ilhan Omar is set for a rematch with Minneapolis City Council member Don Samuels, who she only beat by like two points right. in 2022. And then, like you said, Summer Lee's being challenged by a local legislator Bavini Patel right. they've they've all got their work cut out for them not to mention 
the funding coming from APAC. There, and and so so these folks, all, all the guys that we would naturally be rooting for, are coming together to counter the amount of money that APAC is is spending against their campaigns. Now APAC is spending like nine figures, and these folks have come up with seven figures. You know, it's not the same. And APAC's been at this a long time. So whatever kind of resistance they put up, you got to wonder if it's going to be enough. Yeah, I think I think it will be with, with most of them. I think the three that you mentioned, uh, I, you know, uh, I think Bowman is going to win also. But uh, yeah, and Summer Lee, I think, is also going to win, uh, you know, because they had really good uh, fundraising numbers. And so, uh, and I think they're they're pretty pretty strong in their districts. Like I said, Bush Bush uh, and uh, you know the Ilhan Omar could probably going to have the toughest time, but uh, I think most of them will win. Uh, it's just it is tough though. Like today, I was talking about uh, uh, half a million dollars that were spent for Keena Collins. Keena Collins, you know, that's that's the the one of the big uh, races for tomorrow. In fact, in I would Illinois. say that, yeah, Illinois Seventh District uh, going up against Danny Davis. Uh, that's really going to be. Uh, it's going to be. Hopefully, it'll be an upset win. You know, because once she wins, I mean, that district is. <laughs> You know, West Side of Chicago, forty-one percent black population. I mean, she, the, the Democrats, going to win that seat. So essentially, whoever wins a plurality in that race is going to be the congressman from the seventh district, or congress, hopefully, be the congresswoman. And so, uh, so yeah, Keena Collins is really good. It's the third time that she's running. Uh, you know, I'm just hoping for that upset. Uh, uh, Kashim uh, Richard uh, is is also he's got a really great issue set. I mean, he's he's really a human rights lawyer, and uh, he's he's really phenomenal. I mean, I've been been really pushing his candidacy. Uh, he's up against in a little bit of a tougher district, you know. Uh, Bill Foster's a conservative Democrat. Uh, you know, it's mainly in the suburbs and it's it's hard to win, you know, in those districts if you're super progressive and you really want to uh, state your values, you know, because, uh, you know, those kind of values are really more, uh, I think they speak to people, people in uh, urban centers more, especially young, young people. I mean, you you look at you look at most of the squad people and uh, leaders and most of them are in, you know, larger cities. I mean, some, I mean, some of them are surprising that they do like Jamal Bowman. I mean, you know, he does have part of the Bronx, but I mean, you know, Westchester County is really good. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, there's a lot of affluent people who live there, but I mean, he, he's a great uh, orator and uh, he was able to, uh, you know, to to really uh, connect with the voters there by beating Elliot Engel a couple cycles ago, and that was that was a definite surprise. I remember when Sam interviewed him when he was still on Ring of Fire. I guess it was uh, maybe this uh, September of the year before. I mean, it was super early, and I was like, "Who is this guy? This guy sounds really good," you know. And you know, he ended up winning, and so that was that was great, and and so. Uh, yeah, again, like we were talking about before, you know, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, if you don't raise the money, it's just the correlation is so strong. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish there were more people who were like, I'm going to ignore all of those, you know, ads, you know, and I'm going to do my do my own research. And I'm going to you know, look at the issues. I'll have my issues set. And that's how I'm going to vote. I'm not going to vote just on negative ads. But Unfortunately, that's just not the case. I mean, uh, I mean, that's why we need campaign finance laws to where it limited limits money in politics to where people will be more focused on issues. And, 
So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you got to win elections to get that passed, though. And so, uh, you know, when is that going to happen? Hmm. I, I hope it happens soon. And then you got to deal with the Supreme Court, who essentially is saying that that is not what we want. And uh, I mean, like, look at the Citizens United uh, decision is so terrible. And we're yeah. still feeling the, the effects from that. But I mean, a lot of it. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be like blame the voter, but I mean, it's not, it's just, you know, I, I just encourage voters to do research on candidates, you know, and uh, that's, that's the way it should be. I mean, absolutely. Because politics is in the, the public eye more and more as like sort of a drama fueled reality tv show where like oh did you hear what marjorie taylor green said did you hear right. what trump said let's take it out of context although there's plenty of things he says that are horrible and we could just criticize him for that and it's all this like weird like drama instead of informing voters and so Unfortunately, you're right. Voters do have to take it upon themselves to look into candidates in their area and find out what they stand for. And that's why, you know, like I, I'm going to have more and more on the show just because it's, you know, if they'll come on the show. Right. I'm inviting them at any rate. Yeah. But what I would like to see is guaranteed. Primary debates and 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 more. um Um more uh, platforming on mainstream media of the candidates, like all the candidates. And because the way they do it now is like, especially for president, they're like, you can get to the debate stage if you if your campaign raises enough money, like you have to raise a certain amount of money before you're allowed to be on the debate stage. I meant to say not the campaign stage, the debate stage. Right. So like you can be in the debates if you make enough money. And there it is. It's like, yeah, because they're going to spend that money on your network, like for ads. And I just, I hate it. So it does drive me crazy. And then you get places like, well, I don't want to skip um, Ohio. Did you want to talk about Ohio first? Yeah, I just want to, to go back to what you're talking about in some of the debates. Uh, like in the 7th District, there were debates, you know, and, and I was like looking at some of the the articles, you know, they were touching on the debates and that's the, that's the race with Tina Collins. And Danny. Yeah. I, I'm, they were televised. Yeah. I mean, I, I just saw press reports. I mean, I didn't really actually go. I'm, they're, they're probably on the, on the web also, but I, I haven't done that. I haven't checked it yet. I, I just saw highlights from it, but I mean, there were some good quotes to where we're like, a on a Kusam, uh, Rashid's, uh, you know, it, in his race against Bill Foster, Foster just refused to debate him. You know, I mean, he just said, no, we're not going to do it, you know? And so, I mean, uh, Rashid raised, uh, I think it was 800, is he, I think $862,000, which is a good amount of money. I mean, most progressives do not raise that much money. I mean, right. unless they're like super established. And so, I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I just wanted to make sure that I, I just like, you know, I I at least promoted these people because, you know, they, they do have the, a better chance than, uh, you know, a lot of others and uh, not too many coming up, you know, uh, in recent. Like I said, if anybody wants to DM me about, you know, candidates I don't know about, you know, uh, it's a uh, uh, you know, rock is dendrite or yeah, the uh, coffin is ho down a H O D W. And so, uh, you know, cause I, I want to hear about them. I'm, I'm looking for them. Haven't, you know, like I said, Jen Perlman is going to be on next. I mean, I know that her, uh, her debate or her uh, primaries in August. And so, uh, but besides that, there just aren't too many that I've seen. Well, just so, just so everyone watching knows, John's um, his Twitter will be in the description of this video, but it all, it is also pinned in the chat right now. So if you know of somebody, let him know. Um, you know, I guess it's the um, groups that we are looking to hear or or looking to for candidates would be like 
Working Families Party, just as Democrats, right? Um, Democratic Socialists of America, our revolution. And those happen to be the ones, along with Jewish Voice for Peace, those happen to be the left-wing groups who are forming that Reject APAC coalition that I was talking about. But that's really, those are the groups we're looking to for candidates, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, they're essentially just uh, promote the candidates. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know that like uh, Justice Democrats, they did recruit, like they recruited AOC, you know. I mean, they they were pretty active at the at the very beginning. Right now, they didn't they didn't promote anybody, any non incumbents this cycle, and that was a big story. Also, brand new Congress actually hmm. dissolved, you know, because brand new Congress actually uh, promoted more people than uh, Justice Democrats, but they completely dissolved. And yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of a long, I mean, process that's been going on over the past year and a half. That you know, because. Uh, the main thing is that Joe Biden is a centrist Democrat, and that's what dominates the airwaves right now. You don't in the last two presidential cycles, Bernie was out there, could always pushing these ideas. You know, Medicare for all, uh, you know, climate change, Green New Deal, having a peaceful uh, foreign policy. You know, not not you know always being involved in in poli foreign policy uh, skirmishes that we don't need to be in you know uh just trying to trying to have have more of a you know tackle income inequality i mean women women's issues you know uh immigration issues i mean there are just so many important issues lgbtqi issues i mean I mean, it just goes on and on, you know, and so uh, all of these issues are important and they're just not being talked about as much as they have been since Bernie first ran, you know, because you just don't hear it. I mean, you, you still hear it on left wing shows, you know, like the Majority Report and other, you know, left wing shows. And those are great. And I love those shows. But it's just not I mean, main, more people still, you know, continue to watch mainstream media, they're not losing their audience, you know, like everybody thought they would. Oh, cables, you know, cables dying, cables dead. It's, it's not, I mean, people are still watching it. In fact, they're watching it more than ever. And that, it, it, that, that is kind of a shame, but I mean, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's easier to access, I think, to people, you know, just turn on the TV and there it is, you know. Well, but. and I, I, you'll hear me criticize alternative media for showing clips from mainstream media. And I'm like, so what are you the alternative to? <laughs> I hate yeah. that. So anyway, I get it. Like you got to start somewhere, right? Like here's, and, and sometimes they, they say, here's a clip from CNN. Let's talk about it. Now let's criticize CNN for how they handled it. So that's okay. I get that. But anyway, so the presidential race, well, that's pretty much over, right? Those primaries are a done deal. I mean, you know, um, Trump and Biden have all the uh, um, delegates they need, right? Yeah. Yeah. They've clinched. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just the health scare now, uh, you know. Uh, that's the only thing that's going to keep either one of them from running. Uh, I mean, from really being on the November ballot. Uh, yeah. What about, so, what about, um, how do you, how do you feel about Florida just calling it? In well, I mean, that happened it? several months ago. So, yeah, uh, how, do, how do you feel about that? Though? Oh, it's because... terrible. Absolutely terrible. I mean, oh. it's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just, I was so upset when, I mean, a, a few other states did that too. And it's just like, why, why are you doing that? I mean, so you know. they all say it's standard operating procedure for an incumbent, right? No, it's not. I mean, it's not. I mean, first of all, uh, that, you know, what happened in 1968 was that should be happening again. You know, I mean, I, I know you can make the point. Well, LBJ chose not to run, and maybe if he would have run, uh, he could have won, you know. But the, re the reason he didn't run was because 
the war was so unpopular, the Vietnam War was so unpopular, and he was just, he wasn't sure if he could win, and he felt it was degrading because, I mean, he didn't really have his, uh, he wasn't a declared candidate. He still won the New Hampshire primary by nine points, but then at that point he just said, "No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna run again," you know. And so, so I mean that could happen again. But there were other people who were challenging, and and then in '76, you know, uh, Ted Kennedy challenged Carter, and that that's happened several times with Republicans too. And so. Yeah, I, I just don't believe that. I, I think that's terrible. And I, I think it that there should always be. And the, the same thing with, with progressives, too. You know, I mean, we're talking about all those people challenging Ilhan Omar and, and, and Cory Bush and, and uh, Jamal Bowman. And, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those people, you know, running the, the non progressives running against somebody who is progressive. You know, I mean, that's the way it should be. It should always be a battle of ideas. And so and I, I just don't believe in this whole incumbency racket. I mean, you know, let's let's have a debate. Let's see who I who has the better ideas and go from there. And uh, I, I hate the income where incumbents are just guaranteed a spot. You know, I mean, I hate that. <laughs> Yeah, more more competitive primaries in theory do more to hold the incumbent accountable, not to right. mention get their administration to produce more innovative policy. Instead of saying, "This is what we're going to do next time," they could be you know doing it now. And and I think that that's it, to me, it feels like one of the most progressive things in politics is to um, pressure democratic leaders to support more competitive primaries. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But they don't want to do that. And it's getting worse than ever. I mean, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, it, it, people don't want to run either because they don't feel they could win. And that's a shame too. Yeah. And I do understand that. Like I was looking up Ohio, uh, and that you know, like Howie Klein, he's a he's the guy you know uh, who's who's always he has a blog and he's been talking about uh, you know promoting progressive candidates for a long time. I mean, you know, he was like a kind of an original blogger back when the internet first started, and when there really weren't too many progressive candidates at all. And, you know, <laughs> and this is you know pre Bernie six twenty sixteen run. And so, uh, and so he is promoting a guy from Ohio. And so I was looking up his district and it was like, yeah, it's like a plus 35 Trump district. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah. okay, you know, I mean, get out there, you know, switch your issues forward. But yeah, it's hard to win. And, you know, so many other candidates, it's, you know, they're getting 25 to 35%. And that's that's great too. Put your issues out there. Make make sure that those issues are important to people. Uh, keep them at the forefront of people's minds. And so, I mean, uh, but you know, it's it, it would be nice if there were some people that were more competitive. And a lot of them is just like some of those districts just aren't competitive, you know. And it's just it's almost impossible to to win in a swing district. It's just, you, it's, it's okay, very so difficult. One question I ask my guests a lot about electoral politics is this framing that I often see in mainstream media where they say that you have to, you know, a Democratic candidate or uh, a progressive candidate has to win over Republican votes no. if they want to win. But what if they're in one of those plus 35 for Trump districts? You kind of do, right? How else, how else are you going to do it? Are there really that many people who aren't currently voting that you could somehow get out to vote or do you have to win over the Republican? Why, why bother if you can't win over Republicans in that district? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a plus 35, if it's anything over plus 10, I think it's a, it's a really impossible task. I mean, the, yeah. the odds of that are literally like one in a thousand of, wow. of to win because there's just, wow. I mean, it's, it's just so, it just doesn't happen, you know, cause I mean, I've been following this for, for decades 
and it just never happens. I mean, the 2014 races, those had some of the biggest polling eras in the Senate race. I think like in Virginia, I believe it was Mark Warner's race they had like a, a consistent 10 point era. And that's the biggest polling era I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I mean, the, obviously the, the Clinton Trump races in the former blue wall states of uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, you know, had big polling misses, six or seven points. Uh, same thing happened in 2020. You know, everybody thought Biden was going to win those those blue, formerly blue wall states that I just mentioned by six or seven points. And he only won uh, Wisconsin by 0 0.6 and Pennsylvania by 1.1. And he did win Michigan by 2.8. Uh, so. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's super difficult to do that. And so, I mean, so I just feel like, you know, you should just always. Always push what you believe in, you know, I mean, I do understand to some degree, you know, if, if it is a kind of a competitive race and. But I mean, mostly I, 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 I think it's just people should just push their ideas. I mean, that's the way Bernie did. I mean, Bernie. You know, he said, you know, this is what I believe in. When he was talking about pollsters, he's like, you know, I don't want to deal with pollsters. <laughs> this is what I believe in. If I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose, you know. And like, what, what, what's a pollster going to tell me that I should change something that I don't believe in, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, but there are other people who are not quite as progressive as Bernie, but are still good. And, you know, do they have a chance of winning if they are more moderate in certain areas in a, in a swingy area? Yeah, sure. I mean, they might get some of those, that small sliver of voters that, that come out uh, who, who are truly independents. Because most of the people who say they're independents aren't actually independents. They're, you know, they're lean Republicans or lean Democrats. and so. Uh, so it's just, it's just super hard to, to find those, those true voters, but I don't know, there's usually, you know, eight to 12% that are true independents, you know, depending on, on the district or the state, you know, it's just, it's hard to, to know for sure. Uh, but how, how did you feel about the, um, uncommitted votes on super Tuesday? I, I think, uh, Overall, of course, we already knew they weren't going to be as major um, in numbers as Michigan had been the prior week. But do you think that, were you impressed? Do you think that it had any impact? And I don't think that we have too many opportunities for that going forward. I think tomorrow it's Kansas might have some uncommitted vote on the ballot. But otherwise, I don't know. What do you think about that? Is that, I don't think, I don't know if it's making a difference with Biden. Do you? Yeah, I think it's making a slight difference, but uh, I, yeah, I, overall, I think it's a good move to make. I mean, you know, like in Texas, I voted for Marianne Williamson. You know, I think she's a good candidate. I think, I'm not sure we talked about this on the air last time, but uh, yeah, I, I do think that, I, I think that people don't, uh, they try to, put too much into like it has to be the perfect candidate you know as a yeah. i mean what i like about marianne exactly. williamson <laughs> you know is is that you know she may not have the greatest you know personality or something of that sort i mean i i like her personality personally but uh but i mean i i can see why why people would say you know she hasn't really achieved anything in politics and she's an outsider and she has no chance of winning and like, why, why should I support her? But I mean, I guess my answer to that would be because she supports the issues that I believe in. And so, you know, you don't have, she doesn't have to be like the perfect candidate and she, she has no chance of winning. And so why not have a protest vote who was for somebody who, actually you know is a real person to where uncommitted isn't a real person it's just it's just a protest vote and so i i kind of think like i think a, a lot of people put so much energy into it 
I mean, I do understand it, and I think it has helped people, but I think it's a, I think it's a little bit misguided. I, I would like to see, you know, I would like to see Marianne Williamson get, you know, fifteen percent of the vote, or or ten percent of the vote, or twenty percent of the vote. You know, I mean, on a personal level, that's what I would like to see, but. I do understand what, why people vote uncommitted, and I do think it's a good thing that they're doing that uh, as opposed to voting for Biden. Uh, so, yeah. Professor Harvey K said the exact same thing. He wishes people had voted for Marianne Williamson. Now, he's an advisor to her campaign, so I guess there's that. But it makes sense because while I'm all in favor of People can vote however they want. Uh, I'll always advise people what I would do, and they can listen to that or not. And I can have folks like yourself on the show, and people will be that much more informed for sure. But um, I like the idea of a protest vote in cases like this, where it's like, what else can you do to get the president to listen to reason? And, And people are like, well we can definitely change his mind. And I'm like, yeah, but that's after 30,000 lives have been lost. I don't understand. Like, like I'd rather have somebody else in there than not just say, Oh, let's make it like, let's let him know he'll lose to the Republican. Let's get a better Democrat in there. That's why it's a primary. So anyway, I get the protest vote. I like it. I know that it, you know people feel backed into a corner for sure, but um, yeah, I was going to have an interview with Marianne Williamson tonight. She had to reschedule. I my sense is when you're on the campaign, it's just rescheduling. <laughs> you're not scheduling; you're just constantly rescheduling because there's a lot of rescheduling going on. <clears throat> I'm working with like four different candidates, and one of them is rock solid scheduled. And the rest are all rescheduling, which just seems like the nature of it. Speaking of which, so Jen Perlman's coming on tonight. Um, you like her? She ran in 2020 of all years. You yeah. know, that's a tough one. Got 30% of the vote against a candidate who is like high profile and highly problematic. Like people do not like Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She had to step down from the DNC after rigging the vote for Hillary Clinton against Bernie Sanders in 2016. And she's still going strong. Of course, she has a lot of pro-Israel and APAC money coming in. Lots. Um, Something like 90,000 this year alone already just from APAC. But um, I wonder... What was it that, and I mean, for Jen Perlman to get 30% of the vote in 2020, seems like a big deal, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of progressive candidates get that amount, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's good. I mean, I, yeah, sure. I I think, uh, I I think I remember Sam interviewing her first, uh, I think on uh, Ring of Fire, uh, I think in, might have been in 2019 maybe or 2020 that's when i first heard of her and yeah i think she's the good candidate i like her issues set uh i think uh you know i I basically mostly agree with everything that or you know most of what she says uh and so yeah i think i think it's really positive get more people running get get those ideas out there and uh you know just make make uh you know slow progress that's <laughs> I, mean, I wish it would i wish it well happen all at once you know where we would have this great you know uh, configuration of, of of progressives who would have this massive win you know in you know 20 20 30 seats but uh it, it just seems to go in trickles you know uh four or five seats here four or five seats there uh you know, like I said, it's most mostly in urban centers is where they win uh, the the most progressive seats. But uh, so, so why do you think it is that Debbie Wasserman Schultz? I mean, there's obvious reasons, perhaps, but why do you think it is that she's unbeatable, or up till now, anyway? I mean, um, she's not popular. <laughs> Her own party 
doesn't necessarily, I mean, she has a history of irritating her own party. Like, I don't, I don't like, um, in 2011, she got pushed back from her party for wanting to hire a donor's like daughter, um, um, for like, a you know, pretty good position. I forget it. It was like, like Jewish to voter relations or something like that. And, um, she got a lot of pushback from the Democrats on that. And then she had a, she called a meeting with Obama just for that. And after the meeting, Obama reportedly said to his staff, really? <laughs> you going to get a meeting with me and that's what you want to talk about? And then she went and hired that person anyway. Yeah, and so, I agree. I mean, that, you know, it's just like, then 2016 happened. And I guess people are like, well, she's willing to take one for the team, maybe? I don't know. What do you think it is? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah I agree. She is very problematic. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's just the whole centrist democratic uh, ideology is just, it's it's frustrating, you know. I mean, because there, there are some issues that I do agree with her on, you know. I mean, mostly women's rights, you know, abortion issues. Uh, not too many, not too many yeah. other things, though. I mean, because yeah. I mean, almost all Democrats, you know, support ab abortion issues, and that's really good. Uh, but on just about everything else, yeah, I disagree with her. Uh, yeah, she's, she's just not, not so great. Uh, I don't really know that district, uh, that well, I know that she only won by like 11 points. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like a, I mean, that's, that's still a good margin, but it's not like a 20 or 30 point win. So, uh so yeah hey here's a super chat let's get this up there this is specifically for you jake has five dollars fellow san antonian here what city council or mayoral candidates should i look out for also propositions okay well i mean the the uh let's see uh I'm trying to remember now uh Terry Castillo is really good. She represents the West Side. I was trying to remember what district she she uh, represents. Uh, we've had a few Twitter exchanges. Just really DSA endorsed. Excellent. You know, really, really uh, I think that she's phenomenal. She serves her community so well. Uh, another person is, uh, I think his name is Jalen McKee. Uh, I think it's... I think it's Rodriguez is the last name. I could be wrong about that. Uh, and he's also very good. Uh, he's, his Twitter handle is called The Loser Teacher. He used to be a teacher. And uh, just, again, you know, DSA endorsed, you know, just, just super strong on economic issues, just real. You know, these are champions for working class people. And this is like, this, these are some people that I think, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, they should, they're going to really have a, a bright future if, if the country, you know, continues to move the way it is demographically. You know, you look at, you look at issue sets, you look at voting, uh, who younger people are voting for. And I, I just, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of hope that it's going to get much better, you know, uh, as younger people become more mature and hopefully they'll, they'll stay progressive. Uh, as far as mayoral candidates, I, they next year, I think is the mayoral election. From what I've heard, Ron Nirenberg is very much a centrist mayor. who's had his run. I think he's, he's not going to run again, or maybe he's, uh, he doesn't, he's, I think there's a term limited to some degree. I'm, I'm not mm. absolutely sure about that. And so there's a lot of talk about who may be running for mayor next. Uh, from my understanding, he's not going to run again. Uh, and so, or maybe he's term limited. And so, so that'll be interesting to see, you know, I mean, maybe Terry Castillo will run for mayor. I mean, and uh, I mean, that would be great. I mean, she's just so phenomenal. So 
How about propositions? Anything on the ballot? Where- um, no, because like I said, the, the, the elections are next year. And so uh, they're, they're an off, off year elections. Uh, so, uh, so there was a good proposition uh, that was uh, trying to promote. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, but it, it was essentially about, I think it was the use of force by the police. And that didn't do so well. Uh, I think it only got about 35% of the vote. And so, uh, but I mean, they had some good people supporting it and I certainly supported it. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, (laughs) you know, a lot of older voters just don't, don't get it. I mean, a lot of them are great. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's not all of them. It's just, that you know, as a percentage, you know, older voters just have a, a tendency to be more conservative, uh, more moderate. And, uh, you know, the younger voters, they really, you know, I have great admiration for them. I mean, they, I think they're extremely wise and, uh, you know, you look at, Look at MR, and uh, I think uh, you know their audience is mostly younger people. I mean, I think Sam had had a lot of older people, let's say ten years ago, or and, and I, I know he still has a certain percentage, but I mean, a lot of it is just are younger people, and uh, and I just I think that's great. I mean, I, I think I just have so much hope for them and hope hope for the future. I mean, yeah, it's a really switched on audience. I like definitely, it definitely. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. I can't wait to have you back on again um, and keep that maybe, maybe not feud going with Sam and company over at the Majority Report. I'm not 100% sold that it isn't some sort of a feud. It would be good for my numbers if it was, I think, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, like I said, everyone should give John a follow and definitely... I mean, it's you're only going to benefit. You're if you're interested or want to be interested or more in the know about um, elections and polling and the numbers. You're only going to benefit from paying attention to what John's got to say. That's why we keep having him on. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap? No, I, I, I guess the main thing is just about. Uh, about you know if you do live in the the illinois district that i talked about you know seventh district 11th district fourth district sixth district you know you've got progressive candidates running in all of those districts and i just you know think you should support those candidates uh who are uh kina collins uh rish rashid uh, kasim rashid uh, there's a the, kina collins is seventh uh rashid uh Kasim Rashid and the uh, Rashid, rather Rashid in the 11th district, uh, Chewy Garcia in the 4th district, and and the uh, who's and uh, what's the other one is uh, Maynor Abad in the 6th district, and so those those are I mean, like to see a good showing from them, and uh, hopefully we'll kind of kind of buck the trend of progressives not doing so great. And also I did mention the, the, the uh, woman who won in Adam Schiff's district or had the most votes. She will win. She will be the Congresswoman in the California third district, Laura right. Friedman. And so I, I was happy, happy when I read about her and I was like, Oh, good issue sets. I mean, maybe not as radical as some of the people I like, but I mean, still, still good. Kind of like a Becca Belint in Vermont, you know, just, just the real solid, solid democrat that's great and if anyone knows of any other candidates you heard the guy dm (laughs) him let him know he will look into it he will promote them he will track them john thanks so much for coming on i really appreciate it all right sounds good thank you very much appreciate it okay all right well guys i'm not done talking smack about debbie wasserman schultz um, when I mentioned Jen Perlman and she was primarying Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, fairly recently, some folks in the chat were like, who's Debbie Wasserman Schultz? Huh? <laughs> Let me remind you, in 2016, 
Debbie Wasserman Schultz was head of the DNC and rigged the primaries in favor of Hillary Clinton, causing Sanders to lose the nomination. You may recall, emails were leaked. That was the big year that a lot of emails were leaked. And so the whole thing was documented, um, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> there was a class action lawsuit where the judge said, yeah, all this stuff happened, but it is what it is. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. There was a class action lawsuit filed in 2016. On August 25th, 2017, federal judge William Zlotch dismissed the lawsuit after several months of litigation. He said, in evaluating plaintiff's claims at this stage, the court assumes their allegations are true, that the DNC and Wasserman Schultz held a palpable bias in favor of Clinton and sought to propel her ahead of her Democratic opponent. So they're, they're like, yeah, all this happened. The court continues, for their part, the DNC and Wasserman Schultz have characterized the DNC's charter's promise of impartiality and even-handedness as mere political promise, political rhetoric that is not enforceable in federal courts. That was the problem and why it was being dismissed. They say the court does not accept this trivialization of the DNC's governing principles. While it may be true in the abstract that the DNC has the right to have its delegates quote, go into back rooms like they used to and smoke cigars and pick candidates that way, the DNC, through its charter, has committed itself to a higher principle. The order to dismiss reaffirmed that regardless of whether the primaries were tipped in Hillary Clinton's favor, the court's authority to intervene based on the allegations of the kind set forth in the plaintiff's complaint is limited at best. They do not rule on those kinds of cases. It is what it is. That's what they said. And so they dismissed it. They also said, yeah, it's real. And then even guys like Harry Reid were saying, yeah, we knew all this was going on. It's true. It's real. It's just how they do it. And it's not technically illegal. We don't like it. <laughs> it sure didn't help anything when you look at how that uh, actual election turned out, right? But anyway, uh, it really is what it is now. So fast forward to 2023, November of last year, where Debbie Wasserman Schultz made remarks, uh, her, had remarks that made headlines once again. Tensions boil over as Democrats' Israel divide deepens. This is from CNN. Rep. Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida set off an uproar in the House Democratic Caucus when she bluntly described her view of members who wouldn't back a resolution affirming support for Israel in its war against Hamas. Someone who votes against this, I would think, doesn't have a soul, Wasserman Schultz said. Uh, and, um, you know, that sort of rhetoric has been used uh, negatively before throughout history to describe people of color, and it was sort of off-putting in the moment since the majority of people she was commenting on were of color. Uh, here's some. Here's a re response from uh, Pramaya Jayapal. I think it's outrageous for Democrats to criticize Democrats on these votes. Keeping in mind that Jayapal, the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, um, was um, censured over her comments um, using the phrase from the river to the sea. So you win some and then you keep winning some and you got to ask why. But back in 2020, now we're going back again. Back in 2020, um, Jen Perlman was a progressive challenger to Debbie Wasserman Schultz in Florida's 23rd district. Uh, she said in her statement, my name is Jen Perlman. I'm challenging Debbie Wasserman Schultz in the Democratic primary in Florida 23, which covers Broward County and a portion of Miami-Dade County. I'm running for Congress to fight for social, economic, and environmental justice. I have never run for office before because one, I don't lie. And two, I can't be bought. And three, I smoke weed. This is our candidate, you guys. If I lived in Florida 23, I'd be voting for him. I was asked to run for this office by members of the Progressive Caucus. Um, and so 
they go on to say, I'm an attorney, I'm an advocate, and a mom. All things that matter mat, make for a fierce fighter. I have practiced law in public, private, and pro bono sectors and have always seen myself as an advocate for justice. Quote, justice is what love looks like in public. Dr. Cornell West. Uh, people funded social Democrat challenging a career corporatist. I believe that in order to return our country to a functioning republic, we must elect representatives who, one, do not take corporate money, and two, are not looking for a career. Our representatives cannot properly serve us if they are beholden to either corporate interest or themselves. I'm running on a populist platform that prioritizes narrowing the income inequality gap and providing a social safety net for all people. While I believe in a robust consumer economy, I do not support unfettered predatory capitalism. In addition, I believe that we must remove the profit motive from healthcare, public education, and corrections. I believe our policy should be determined by science and reason, not religion and greed. And so you'll recall that John was saying a moment ago that most progressive candidates get about 30% of the vote. But 2020 was a different year. That was a rough one for everyone. I personally have been thinking about it a lot lately, reflecting, and I had the same thought over and over again in 2020. I didn't think it could get this bad. I didn't think it could be this divided in a moment where if everyone just took a beat, we might make it out quickly. Instead, it's still going. <laughs> in a lot of ways, the people will comment back when the pandemic was was going on. It's like, it's kind of still going on. You guys are just ignoring it. Um, so 30% of the vote in 2020 is a bigger deal to me than 30% of the vote in any other year. Um, and I can't wait to talk about Jen and see, you know, what what they um what their hopes and dreams are for this race going forward for the record i invited them on the show prior to the announcement that they were running for office so once again letter hack kind of calling it as far as quality interview guest But I know that Jen wants to focus on her policies and her platform and not bashing the opponent. I'm sure it will come up at some point in the interview, but I'm glad to have gotten all that out of the way so that um, you know we can do the bashing on their behalf. But um, it is also true that Debbie Wasserman Schultz, among a lot of other members of Congress, are heavily, heavily funded by APAC. What is APAC? Everyone always says APAC. And everyone always says a lot of things that we're just kind of supposed to know what it means. APAC stands for American Israel Public Affairs Committee. <clears throat> this is from their website. The APAC PAC is a bipartisan pro-Israel political action committee. It's the largest pro-Israel PAC in America and contributed more resources directly to candidates than any other PAC. 98% of APAC-backed candidates won their general election races in 2022. So who, who, <laughs> you know, if our government's bought, you sort of have to wonder who, who buy, who's buying them. <laughs> So look at this. This is some of these are some of the candidates that APAC have backed. Uh, and I, I guess this is 2022, right? So we have let's just let's just skip around. Mike Johnson and Hakeem Jeffries. Right? So Hakeem Jeffries took over for Nancy Pelosi as speaker when she stepped down, and then Mike Johnson became the Republican speaker. Look at, you see what's happening here? They've got the lead of the Republicans and the leader of the Democrats. And I know the whole thing that went down with Mike Johnson and how he got that role. Nevertheless, they're backing all these candidates on both sides. 
you're looking at six candidates right here, three Republican, three Democrat. They're all taking money from the same people. And this is a pro um, Israeli committee. And look, <laughs> be pro Israel. Okay, mate, we can debate that. Taking millions of dollars from them to secure office in the United States government, that sucks. I don't like it. They are actively, here, let me show you. They are actively, bring it up here. Pro-Israel Democrats plot three-pronged strategy to grow their ranks in 2024. Now, this is from December of last year. And this is from, I believe, yeah, Axios. Why it matters. Challenges to reps Jamal Bowman, Corey Bush, both vocal critics of Israel, will receive most of the attention, but the future of the Democratic caucus will be determined by old-school battles between centrists and progressives in record number of open seats. State of play. To date, there have been 23 House Democratic retirements and 11 Republican retirements plus one expulsion. The zoom out. Pro-Israel Democrats are plotting a three-pronged strategy to expand their ranks. One, spend heavily to defeat squad-like Democrats. Two, bolster vulnerable lawmakers facing tough general elections. Three, invest in promising candidates in crowded primaries. The big picture, it's not a firm and fast rule, but Democrats dedicated to Israel's right to self-defense tend to be more centrist on issues like crime and immigration. I'm, we, anyone paying attention knows that. The other side, progressives are more focused on defending their vulnerable members than going on offense. And they are expecting to be outspent. This is a battle for the soul of our democracy. Okay, so this is Israel's position. I almost don't even want to say this stuff out. What's driving the news? The Democratic Majority for Israel PAC released its first round of endorsements on Sunday, including 23 frontliners. Lawmakers expected to have the toughest general election fights in total. DMFI is backing 81 incumbents. So not only is it an uphill battle for these candidates, but the funding is massively against them. And to talk about this more, and... Uh, other topics, I hope. <laughs> Joining me now. Hello, guys. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Does the sound, is the audio okay for you guys? We we're having some we're weird having some problems, weird earlier. problems earlier. Here, no, hold on. I, I hear an echo. Cool. We're good. Do you hear us? Yes, you I hear us? you fine. I can. Okay. Yeah. It's good okay. to meet you, Matt. It's very good to meet you, Matt. I'm Jen. He's Peter. Yes, yes. Well, let me introduce you guys to the audience. Joining me now are two very special guests, attorney, activist, 2024 U.S. congressional candidate and co-host of the Generational Change podcast, Jen Perlman, and treasurer for the Broward County chapter of the Democratic Progressive Caucus of Florida, campaign manager and co-host of the Generational Change podcast, Peter Hager. Jeez, yes. Louise, I got to update my bio. Yeah, he needs to update his bio. So but, I was no, going to ask, are partner. you... No, no, no. Yeah, Are you ahead. still a treasurer? No. Uh, okay. No. I'm, uh, I'm so, a commercial real estate now. I got enough numbers. I got. Yeah. Work. He. He. But he, I mean, we're still affiliated with the Progressive Caucus. Like he's yeah. still. We're still yeah. affiliated. And we still. Yeah. But no, he's not. He's on it anymore. Basically, between his real job and this, it's like that's enough. I find it hysterical how people in the chat that we're looking at right now are like seeing you on Vanguard earlier today. Saw us on yeah. our show just a minute ago, and they're like, "Do you know what that is? That's good. Yeah. Having a good comms yeah. person." Oh, oh well, yeah. I'm not taking yeah. credit for But this. he's the comms person. Yes, and so I will right. comment that th these are this is my my all collected 
like um, vintage shutters because I saw somebody like the background. This used to be in my dining room. And then when we downsized my house, I really had nowhere for them to go. So I decided to just make them the back wall of the studio. Now, normally we wouldn't be dressed like this, but we were actually at an engagement earlier this evening. Yeah, he okay. usually makes me wear a purple shirt well, like, no, or uniform. Rotate. He makes me wear a uniform. We rotate. Chris Garrett's here. So yeah, we got our, we got our people coming. He makes so. me wear a uniform. Yeah. Well, I don't what? think there's anything wrong with uniforms. It's a little weird. No other mm -hmm. show has uniforms. It works for us. All uh, right. I have merch that says I mod for letter hack because I make everyone in my chat moderators. That's cool. Yeah. So it's kind of a gang. <laughs> That's kind of cool. But then what happens if the, if somebody not nice comes in, do they all gang up on them and kick oh, them out? They're, yeah. It's so basically what we've done here is we've created a bar for bouncers. And if you get bounced from that bar, that was on you. So we have yeah. managing mods and standard mods. And if a troll or a bot comes in, they don't last very long at all. So yeah. It's kind of cool. We but kind we're of hacking just the YouTube channel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's all good. And I I, I have fairly thick skin. So I'm cool. good. Good. Okay. Well, okay. So, but I do want to make sure that I'm pronouncing Peter's last name right. Is it Hager? Hager. Hager. Yeah. Hager. Okay, good. Uh, Hager. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I will screw up a name and never get corrected out of politeness, I guess. But it's yeah, like, please I do my me. best to make people. Well, this is the thing, like, and I especially coming. So tonight we were at an iftar dinner um, in Miami, which, you know, it's the month of Ramadan. And so we've been going to a lot of these dinners and it's the hardest part for me are the names. A lot of the names of the people that I'm meeting, oh. whether they're from Pakistan or Turkey or what, like there's all these people. And it's like, I, if you have trouble with regular names, like yeah. Anglo, like what we would call our normal Anglo names. Oh, it's a whole other. So I've gotten to where I ask people to spell it because then I can sort of visualize it in my head. If, like if somebody just says it and they have a thick accent, it's like, good luck to me with that. And so if I ask them to spell it, then I have a better chance of being able to like see it in my mind and say it properly. You know what I mean? I mean, I, but that's I all need, I can do. I need name tags with a phonetic pronunciation. I'm that bad. Um, no, I but, would like that too. And I, I want to walk around with them and write the people's names on it. And then when they're not looking, just go like this to them. And I swear to you, <laughs> I, by the end of an event, everybody would be walking around with their names. <laughs> so so I would know who everybody. Well, I, I, otherwise, yeah. Anyway, that's my sinister plot. <laughs> that's great. Um, okay. Look, I, I don't know if, if this got lost in the shuffle, cause I know you've been doing a lot of these shows. I typically draw my guest while we talk for part of the okay. interview. Is that okay oh, with that's you guys? Fine. Okay. Absolutely. As long as it's... you don't okay, don't, as long as you don't give me a double chin. I don't think I have. Nothing involving the <laughs> neck like don't no, I'm serious. If, if I have a double chin, then that'll be the last time I'm here. So well, that's there's all I'm saying. Preliminary art, you can see it and then we can I I ink pencil. No, you just so... don't give me a double chin and we won't have a problem. All will be well. Um okay. So I do what how's this? All right, that's fine. Okay, that's good. fine. All right, I don't cool. have a double chin. What the All right. hell? You look what like a you? monk. <laughs> like a what? You look like a monk. I, I don't mean, know I'll why. You look it. like you're like a... it's cool. That's I, all right. I was like, how fast did you do that? Did you just do that now? No. I'm gonna I'm oh, gonna okay. I I always ink the pencils. That's that's what we do. That's, that's totally part of the show. Fun. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't take all right, up the good. whole and interview. You definitely I like that I have perky bosom. So that's good. That's awesome. Well, I'm this pushing is, 53. That's perky bosom. Hey, I okay. got my AARP membership card in the mail today. Oh, wow. I'm taking advantage of those perks like starting now. <laughs> As well you should. It freaks me out that the magazine comes for my husband. <laughs> it's funny. I'm in the 50s club. Um, okay, I'm in so there. there you go. So if I'm looking down while drawing, I am listening. That's something I That's always, fine. But, and, and you know who commented, uh, I haven't run this interview yet, but I just recently had Katie Halper on the show and she commented a lot on the drawing while I was doing it. I what love when people do, she was just really distracted by, by the drawing, the, the fact that somebody was drawing her, she couldn't, I don't know. It, it well, we'll just see. made it fun. Um, we'll see if I can, we'll see if I can do like, it's sort of like walking and chewing gum at the same time. I, I think, I think I can. And I know that like, for example, right now I'm looking down, but cause I'm looking at you, but if I look up, you know what I mean? So I don't take offense to people not looking straight at the camera. Cause I understand that we're wherever we are okay. again, as long as, yeah. yeah, as long as I don't look bad 
And just <laughs> okay, as long I'll... as I can't be confused with like Marjorie Taylor Green on that, then that's no, all yeah. good. All right. You're good. Pretty cool. Okay, so I want to talk about your use of online media. And of course, I want to talk about okay. the campaign. But I just want to say up front, I know you'd rather talk about the things that you're running on and, and your campaign's mission and all that, as opposed to trash talking your opponent. I think I've heard yeah, you say I, this I a couple it. of times. Don't yeah. worry, we just did all that before you okay. came on. So we kind okay, of got yeah, that I don't out like away. to do that. I really don't. It's, I'm it's sure your opponent will come up. But as far as trash yeah. talking, you're off the hook on that. So Okay. The way I'd like to start is how I, I start with all my guests. I want to ask you for an origin story of sorts. How did you guys meet and what are the origins of your your podcast, Generational Change, and and how how did you end up working together on the campaign? Okay, so Peter and I met at the very end of Tim Canova's 2016 race wherein he was running for the same seat I'm running for. And I was a volunteer in that campaign. Peter was a volunteer in that campaign, but we didn't cross paths until like the final night when it was like the lost party essentially. And then we just met and just sort of stayed in touch online. Like, Oh, did you see this? Or just like political stuff. And then at one point I was in status coup with Jordan Cheriton and I look up and Peter's sitting there next to Jordan. And I'm like, huh, that's kind of interesting. So then I messaged him and I'm like, oh, I'm watching you on status coup. And I don't know, from that point, we just started talking more. Then we got together when he was back in town at a comedy club. He thought it would be a good idea for me to run. I told him he was insane. And then that was basically it. And oh, then so he we just motivated. He suggested you hadn't thought of it before Peter brought no. it up. Well, I look, I've been told many times growing up throughout life that, oh, you should run for office. But there was a lot of variables. I always sort of joke that it's I don't lie. I can't be bought and I smoke weed. And those were the three things that I always sort of would say to people when they're like, you should run. I'm like, yeah, but see, there's these things. And then after Bernie in 16 and AOC in 18, it appeared that there could be an opening for a non-corporate person, not, not like an easy opening, mind you, but at least like the possibility was there. And so, I mean, that's as far as it ever, I, I didn't really think, and I certainly was not thinking I was going to be challenging Debbie. This is my congressperson. Like it didn't even occur to me. And when he said that, I told him he was nuts. I think, I don't remember what I said. Like, I, it was not like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I think the first thing I said was what? I think, I don't even remember. I'm like, get out of here. Like, I. So we were at a comedy show. We met up at in Miami. We just happened. Uh, uh, well, the reason we all just happened to be there is because a lot of people in the progressive movement in South Florida were at the show. It was uh, it was Graham Elwood and Ron Pacone. And they were doing their comedy tour at the time. And we just both happened to be at this event. And I just at the end of the night, I just remember telling her, I said, I don't know what it is, but I think he would make a very formidable opponent to Wasserman Schultz. And so her initial reaction was one of surprise. But no, you weren't. You actually thought, well, you know, and I just yeah, I mean, I guess I what you know what it was. It wasn't that that anybody no one had ever said to me, you should run. But I say this. It's that no one else ever offered to help. Right. Like yeah. you weren't just like, oh, you should run for office in some like, you know, passing. You were like, you should run for office. We should do this. Like and it was always like, I don't know. Well, that's always the hardest reality about this actual race in general is that you do need, uh, you know, it doesn't take a village. It takes a city. It takes, uh, it takes <laughs> an unbelievable amount of people who want to help. Um, you obviously have to have a staff, which we have this time, which is great. Um, but you have to continue to have those volunteers that truly do believe that change is possible. It's not going to be easy, but of course, if it was, then, you know, everybody would do it. They know that it's a, it's an uphill battle, but it is a battle worth fighting. And right now, more than ever, the battle is worth fighting because our congressperson is somebody who is as knee deep with the Israel lobby as anybody in this country. And in the democratic party, she's right at the top. And so when you have somebody who went on CNN this morning to suggest that it is all Hamas's fault that humanitarian aid is not getting in, even though the Associated Press made it very clear that this is because of Israel, that's not happening. When you have a mouthpiece at that level saying those things, that's the type of person that's actually getting innocent people killed. And when that type of thing is happening, it, it's really a question of, do you have a principle that you want to fight for? And- if you end up winning a congressional seat as a result, yeah. that's great. But this is more of a, 
we have to do this rather than we want to do this. And the truth is, Peter really, really dislikes her and has for a really long time. And I think that when he thought or even considered the fact that there was the potential of having somebody that would be willing to do this, I think that that's really, I mean, it was sort of like happenstance. And then we ran our campaign kind of just winging it for the most part. And um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, we did better than I think anybody would have anticipated considering how we just really didn't know. No, I we think that we, went, things, in, but... we <laughs> went in with a leap of faith. I think that that's a fair assessment. And that's where the whole, you know, Jordan Cheriton is, is a personal friend of mine. And so he was willing to have Jen on right off the bat to yeah. give her a little bit of a boost. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that people were initially, um, they didn't really know how to take it because obviously they'd seen the two races that Tim Canova had had. And obviously, uh, you know, we don't have to get into him, but obviously no. there was a lot of, <clears throat> there was a lot of loss, uh, a, lot, a lot of love loss within the movement. And a lot of lost momentum. And that really hurt. It did. And it so hurt us locally people, a lot. Yeah, a lot of people may not have necessarily believed in the prospect that somebody, somebody could actually take Wasserman Schultz out. But I think a lot of people really liked Jen and the message that she was putting out there, the whole concept of transforming politics into service. And actually doing deal. service. Yeah. We ran we a service-based campaign. And, you know, pr predominantly because we started so far out last time just because we started with no name recognition. So it felt like I was basically, I started really in my mind, I was running for Congress in January of 2019 was when Peter and I sort of started planning and working on it and figuring it out. And then it wasn't until August, which was a year out that we even filed papers or people knew. But so that campaign I knew was going to be really long. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to waste my time just running to put myself in a seat. And so we ran a service-based campaign and all of our volunteers did service. And I felt incredibly productive from that. So it, it was really, it was good in a sense that we did serve the community in the, in the short term. But in the long term, what we've built up is community networks and goodwill that you really can't buy. You really can't buy. I mean, you can buy some votes and you can, you can do that. And you can get people to get in line for you and you could bully people to do stuff. But in order for people to really like you and be behind you, you need to be one of them and you need to be in that community and you need to be serving that community and going out of your way for people and showing up for them. And so I just decided if you want to be the representative, just be the representative. And so that's what I did. And, and it's been amazing. I, I honestly, it's been amazing. And even since that campaign, we, we transitioned it to our podcast. We still stay involved with service. We still work in the community, like in terms of building connections and coalitions and, and showing up where we're needed and showing up on picket lines with SEIU and all of those things. And you can't buy that. She can't buy that. And, and that's just the truth. So when we look at our national campaign, which is national, we are fundraising, we need money. We need, we are, because we don't take corporate money and we're all small dollar donations. Um, although if anybody wants to max out at 3,300, we don't say no, but we're only individual donations. And so, yes, that is a message we put out on a national platform, but locally is something that we work in a different way from a sense of actually being in the community and actually being hands-on, knowing who our municipal people are, knowing um, which condos are having trouble with their homeowners insurance and knowing which people need their potholes fixed on their streets and knowing. And those are things that I have been able to learn and do over the past three years that I don't think our Congresswoman has ever done. To be honest, with you, I have not seen her at any of those things. And she's been my congressperson for 20 years. So I think that that's how we connect with people. Um, so it's like fundraising, national, serving, local. Um, and that's really just logistics, right? Like I, if somebody in Cleveland needs help, I'd be happy to help you. But it certainly is not as easy as it is for me to help somebody here. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to do and build a network and build a coalition. I'm for I spend I cannot tell you how many times a day I'm connecting people to other people. That's that is one of the primary things I've been doing since I started this is building this web 
And um, I keep doing it. And that that's where you, the more we connect, eventually we become solid, right? Like eventually it's not, there's not holes in it anymore and we just become solid. So my goal is to take the people from the labor movement, the people from the environmental movement, the people that are the anti-war people, all the different groups that are out there being active right now. My goal is to combine all of them to come out for each other and build up enough power and enough community support to eventually get to a general strike. And I know that that is something that is like, like, you know, pipe dreams right now, but I, I just feel like we have to build the coalition amongst all those different groups, or we're just going to constantly be fractured by issues. And every issue has its supporters. Like if everybody showed up for everybody, we win. So I, I feel like that's what I, I spend in a lot of time doing is coordinating community. And yeah, I don't know. Does that explain it well? Yeah, that's great. And and yeah. I'll add to that, that I think that you guys have a refreshingly natural, no-nonsense attitude on your podcast. And I wonder, is that deliberate or is that just, is it natural? Is that just how you guys are? <laughs> I have no other way of being. And when I say to you, like, and he'll tell you, I have no other way of existing in this world than exactly like this. And he, he's tried. He's tried. He tried first campaign to manage me. He tried. And eventually it was like, you just got to let Jen be Jen. Like, I don't know any other way to be. I'm going to say things that are wrong sometimes. Sometimes I screw up. Sometimes I put my foot in my mouth. It happens. Managed but I feel in like, that way, like gaffes or. Well, it's like things happen. Like uh, there are sometimes I'll be like, oh, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. But the thing is, is that when you're coming from a pure place and you're being organic and your, your goal is to really help people and help the least of these people will forgive your, your, your nonsense sometimes, you know, but I feel like I'm always better just being a hundred percent me. One, I don't know how else I would be. How else could I, am I ever different? Like, am I ever different than this? Well, the thing about being a politician is that you're basically trying to present yourself in a capacity that's different when the cameras are on versus when they're off. He'll tell you. I'm... And so if that's who you think you're trying to pretend <laughs> you are, then you're not really endearing yourself to anybody. There's a reason why we want to get away from that. It's part of the reason why Trump has so much appeal. And I would even say RFK yeah. has an appeal as well. People who come off real. They come off real. They'll go far. And he goes far because he really doesn't care. And as much as people don't like that because he's just so unkempt, as Jen would put it, uh, there is an appeal to a broken system when somebody's actually going to say that the system's broken. Who's unkempt? Who was I saying was Trump. unkempt? Oh, yeah, he's very unkempt. Thank you, Chris. Oh. I was going to say that, too. I was going to say that, too, Matt. I appreciate like the watermelon earrings on that drawing. I was worried they look like pizza. You know what? Color, but, but everyone knows that they're not. <laughs> yeah, but everyone yeah. knows that they're not. And it's so I, I think it's awesome. <laughs> the other thing that you have to remember is, um, you know, like right now, and Jen has spoken on this multiple times, um, we even got an email from somebody the other day who was, who was, who was feeling sad that Jen is not being considerate enough to the feelings of affluent Jewish people in this country because they feel like they're being targeted. Well, with all due respect, um, there are people that your people are literally reigning hell. They're, they're, it's hell for No, not over. their people because it's not a Jewish well, thing. It's a true. Zionist thing. Well, but the people that they're the, well, defending. The, well, that they're defending, yes. yes. And so when you literally are raining hell from above on innocent people for months and months and months, creating generational trauma, death, famine, destruction, and genocide, and, and it is a genocide, whether you like it or not, uh, that is never going to be something that people are going to get over. Then I'm sorry, but your feelings really don't matter. No. Not in this instance. This is what I think. So I got an email and sometimes like if, I always tell them, I don't want to know the negative stuff unless it ever becomes a majority opinion in which I need to know. But when it's just sort of like, I feel like sometimes saying to people a couple of things. One, well, when you run for Congress, you do it your way. And sometimes I want to say, I'll let you know when I'm having focus groups. But until then, I don't want to hear it from the peanut gallery. If somebody has something really constructive and you email me about or whatever, but complaining with personal anecdotes that somehow somebody's feelings are hurt, that I'm not being sensitive to people that I do not find oppressed. Um, I just, I, I cannot, I don't care about your feelings. Which also speaks I just to, don't. Yeah, which also speaks to the, to the bigger issue here, which again is having a representative like we do, who is, I think for all intents and purposes, one of the absolute worst that we have in the country. Because it's not just a question of her being nasty, being a complete corporate shill, all those things. It's the fact that she went on national television and deliberately lied to the entire country yeah. regarding what's going on. 
Like that's that's serious malpractice as far as I'm concerned. There's there's stretching the truth, which a lot of people do, but then there's just outright lying about circumstance. And that is a big problem. And that's where I think the authenticity that Jen brings to the table is refreshing. And I think a lot of people agree with it. Now, granted, they're going to move heaven and earth to keep her suppressed. Oh, APAC's coming for me, people. APAC, I've been taunting them for the better part of a year and a half anyway. But you have to welcome their hatred because ultimately they're wrong. And part of the reason they win is because people always go on defense. Oh, I'm not an anti semite Never. I, like I, I started over a year and a half ago on offense because I, this is how I feel. This is my position. I feel I am on the correct side of history. I have nothing to be defensive about. So I am tired of uh, anybody Jonathan, who is on the right side of history. Seriously, own that. Own that. Like, I do not care at all what they say about me. Jonathan Greenblatt, who's the head of the ADL, has been caught on mic multiple times saying we have to, we have to, we have to deal with TikTok, which means mm. we have to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. And so right. all of a sudden, it's gotten rid of, and it's easy to see why. And one of Jen's most viral clips, which came from her first major interview with Kim Iverson, which talks about the dogmatic approach that exists within the Zionist movement that one either stays with, which Debbie did, and one who leaves it, which Jen did, and then kind of crystallized that whole message into about a 60-second clip and all of a sudden, within hours, not a day, not a week, within hours of Congress passing the TikTok ban, that clip was removed. So it's not a mistake. And this is why it is an uphill battle. But people need to understand that censorship is a tool of the wrong. They know that they're wrong and they know they can only get away with it if they censor people. If their message was so pure and benevolent, they would welcome the scrutiny at all times for what's going on, but they know that that's not the answer. Annie Fitzgerald, what are you running for? Put it in the chat. Okay, sorry. Oh, she is um, running to be the first queer and disabled. Um, oh, I forget it. Where is she? Uh, it's in Washington State. She will be on our group show Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. But a state seat? Like it's a state, and it's this a is state seat? And this is or is thing, it? Yeah. And, and this is the thing that I want to point out. And if, if you could just pull up the comment from Soul Life regarding Kim Iverson, Jesus, I, we, we, need to, we, need to be very, we need to be very clear about this. And this is something for your audience and anybody else who's out there. If you think you're getting out of this alive by having comments like that, you've already lost. You don't like Kim Iverson? Who gives a shit? What matters is, is that Kim Iverson is willing to give Jen a platform to get her message out there. Did you know that the big clip that was out there from Kim Iverson has been seen over 100,000 times? That matters. I don't, it doesn't well, mean you have to like Kim Iverson. No, but wait a minute. Let me, let me say That's something. That's exactly else. what I thought when I saw that you were on Kim Iverson. I was like, you're going to reach those people. And here's the thing about Kim Iverson. I like her. I've liked her since I met her the no. first time I interviewed with her when I was running the first time. And I will say this. I don't, that doesn't mean I agree with exactly. Kim on everything. And right. It's not about Jen. It's about the message. Now, are there people who I think are just beyond redemption that oh. you shouldn't go on with? Yeah. Ben Shapiro would be an oh, example well, of somebody that there is no point in going on with somebody like that. Well, but I will say this about Kim, and this is something people don't realize. She does her research, people. She puts in the work and she does her research. And when she said like, whether or not you agree with it, why are people so caught up with having to agree all the time? It's so frustrating. It's like someone has a take that you don't like, so you just write them off and then we don't, like stop labeling people, stop throwing out people because you don't agree with them on things. There, there are way more yeah. important stuff for us to be dealing with right now. I don't agree with Kim on everything, but you know what? I agree with her on a lot of stuff. And I know she does the research, incredibly good research yeah. on Israel too, I might add, considering she filmed her trip going over to West Bank. And just, it's like, she walks the walk, you know? And I I, I just stop picking on people because you just don't agree but with that's them. Also part that's of the so problem. Annoying. But that's also a big part of the problem with the left is that there is this, well, I don't want this person in my sandbox. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, as long as you understand that the big, the, the issue of our time is that corporate special interests bought have bought and paid for our government. Full yes. stop. That is the issue of our time. Everything yes. else is just ancillary. And if you're getting distracted by these other little things about what person <laughs> says about this, another person says about that, it's oh, not God. getting you anywhere. It's, I just, am, it's, it's not just defending not. her. It's just a fact. No. It's just a yeah, fact. Yeah, that, I, I also does think work. You, yeah. you can't let the media you consume define you either. But no. At, at, 
after so so let me ask you this after receiving over 21,000 votes nearly 30 percent of the vote in 2020 of all years right yeah you've got to be hitting the ground running now right your second time around like you said yep. you've got a podcast you're connecting with people locally a, a lot more i love that you say you're running as a democratic candidate in strategy not ideology right like i think it's very it's smart true. you have to be hitting the ground running the second time around and i just wonder like i don't know how it works right i i assume you pick up more votes this time right no. Well, that's that's the goal. I mean, look, we've spent the past few years building up my name, building up the platform. So in theory, yeah, we're coming at this now, not from home plate, right? Like we're coming at this a little ahead. Uh, so I caught between first and second, caught between first and second. Hmm. But like, so, I mean, just putting in the work on the ground, putting in the work on the platform. I think that we're coming at this obviously stronger. Um, the pandemic didn't help. We lost about two months of canvassing, which for a grassroots campaign is is critical. Um, and we also have had a redistricting here that heavily favors us over our congresswoman. Um, just strategically, there's certain districting things. There's certain parts of the district that she have lost that would be not favorable to me. And we've gained part of a district that will be much more favorable to me than her. So there, you know, there's just been a lot of different variables that kind of lend itself to what could be a perfect storm. Um, and it, it's, it's just interesting to watch it unfold, but it feels very organic. And if it's like, if it's meant to be, it's going to be. And I've always said that I've been saying that from the get go, like I can go out and I can meet people and I can be myself. And if people want to support that, yay, great. But it has to be organic. So yes, we're going to be out canvassing, promoting and doing what we need to do because that is incumbent upon me to bust my ass over the next five months to do everything I can to win because people are supporting and donating. We have people that are working. And by the way, if, if when we are having any sort of like success financially and people can get paid on our campaign, which would be fabulous. Um, in theory, I'm like the only person who won't get paid. Uh. So, so when I'm, when I'm dialing for dollars, what I'm keeping in my head is I'm doing it so that our team can function and do what we need to do. Um, and it's, you know, it's definitely going to be a challenge, but I feel inspired by what we're seeing so far. I mean, we, we haven't right. even, it hasn't even been two weeks and already I feel like it's just in a whole different world than last time. So what you're running on is ending wars for profit, healthcare for all, ending corporate welfare, affordable housing, federal jobs, guarantee, environmental justice. Now those are all right on, right? Yes. I'm with you. Um, do you mind if I just cherry pick a couple to ask you about since Please. I don't want to keep you here all night? Okay. Because um, you're reading off of the, um, what was our landing page, our ACLU landing page. But now if people go to our website, there's a lot more uh, detail. The issue, all the issues are up in detail. So you, you're, great. you're just reading off. Yeah. Just, yeah. So yeah and there's, ahead. there's links to all of um, your stuff in the description of this video. And I encourage everyone to check that out and donate and support however you can. Um, ending wars for profit. If you agree that we're living under an oligarchy of sorts, uh, an aristocratic paradigm anyway, which thrives off military and so-called defense spending, ending wars for profit is a tall order. Uh, where do you start? You start by electing people that don't take money from the military industrial complex. Um, that's the first place to start. And I think it's just like anything else. It's an idea that you have to keep repeating over and over and over again, sort of like Bernie with Medicare for all, which brought us to where we are now, considering where we were, let's say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, people weren't really talking about that. And now it's much more commonplace. We still don't have it, but you have to be talking about it before you can even have it. So I think... I feel like it's incumbent upon me to use this platform to put out those messages that I think are things that in my vision, in my ideal universe, we would have, I, you know, and ending wars for profit is like a blurb way. Obviously it's a lot more complicated than just ending wars mm -hmm. for profit, but it really comes down to what are our priorities? What do we care about as people? And right now we have a Congress that's completely beholden to the military industrial complex. We, we have a Congress that gives them more money than they even ask for. It's the most bipartisan thing 
going. And you're right. It's like, how much do you want? Eh, we'll give you more than that. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, look, I do, I do not believe that if we spend money there, it means it can't be used other place. We just came off of our interview with Steve Grumbine. So I am very well versed in the fact that money for that doesn't mean no money for this. But the reality is most people in this country do not want our collective resources being expended in the way that they're being expended. That is vast majority of people do not support what we have been doing overseas for years now, for years. And so you have to wonder, well, if most people don't want that, but it's still happening, where's the disconnect? The disconnect is in the people that are legislating that are either being paid for by Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, or their insider trading is so high from those wars that they're profiting immensely. Um, so it isn't even necessarily profits just for the military industrial complex. It's literal profits for our Congress people from insider trading on these wars. So the first step is to stop electing people that can profit off of this. Because right. to elect people that are profiting off of something and expect them to do something else is kind of just stupid. Um, so that's the first step. And it, it's really... When you listen to the people that have served, that really have served, like we're friends with Matt Ho or, or, or any of the other people on the Eisenhower Network, those are some of your loudest anti-war advocates. And those are the people that have seen it up close and personal. Few people that have seen it up close and personal are advocates for war. Few. Like they are the minority in, in that group. So I feel like it's changing. The narrative is starting to change. People are upset. Military recruitment is so far down. They don't even know what to do with themselves because people aren't signing up for their, their wars anymore. And we just have to keep fighting that what that doesn't create is lowering our standard of living to essentially force people into the military as a jobs program, which is what's done in a lot of places. Um, you know, especially in more oppressed communities, for a lot of people, the only option they see of ever getting out is the military. And so I feel like those things work hand in hand. Like if you make people desperate enough, then they're going to be more inclined to sign up for this because that's their only option. So I just I want to make sure we see the connect between like complete economic disenfranchisement and the military as an option. And so I, I, I really think that we're, we're heading in the right direction in terms of public opinion. Like I, I do feel somewhat inspired that more and more people are waking up to this. But um, as far as like actual policy and legislation, yeah, that we're probably a ways off from seeing anything that's going to be totally productive. Yeah, that's great answers. I mean, just being opposed to it is enough for me. How about environmental justice? What does that entail? And do you have a plan for specifically combating the economic interest within the fossil fuel in industry, which have spent years funding disinformation yeah. um, operations about climate denial. And it's and it's kind of the same thing, too. You know, you can't expect people to fight for climate justice when they take money from the fossil fuel industry. And it, it's all, all of the things that we're talking about, all of it, economic justice, environmental justice, all of it is completely dependent on wrestling our Congress free from corporate tentacles. So it's all sort of the same thing. And the fossil fuel industry and the military industrial complex work hand in hand. In fact, the military industrial complex is like the largest user and um, polluter it, that there is. So those things are also really connected. Um, as far as environmental justice, for me, what it really means at the most imminent points is people need clean water at this point in this country. Like I honestly, at this point to be discussing other things seems far-fetched when the people in Flint, Michigan haven't had clean water in how, over 10 years. And that's just right. one place, right? So, so environmental justice for me is really speaking for the least of these in this country right now, people in East Palestine, people that are being poisoned whether it's water, soil, we have it here with big sugar is poisoning us because we allow these corporations to get away with it. So it's really, it's big. I know it's like this daunting big thing. And I just have to keep banging on it over and over and over again. But I'm flexible with policy. I always say that I'm policy fluid. Um, when really, really smart people put their heads together, they can come up with solutions for problems. And if our motivations are to help people, we can figure something out. That's what it, you just have to have people that want to help people all working together and you can come up with ideas, but I just know we could do better. And the reality is if we gave a crap about working people or poor people in this country, then we wouldn't have them not having clean drinking water. That that's, you, that's what I know. You would do so well 
in a debate. Is there any hope of that? You against, mean with Debbie? Yeah, against Washington. No, no, she won't even acknowledge I exist. She'll get through this entire campaign without even mentioning that she has a primary challenger. And the thing is, is that I actually don't like to debate. It's not my thing. Really? Um, yeah, I don't like, I, I went to law That's school. Surprised. I That's surprised. That's the first. I was a litigator, but um, huh. because it, I don't want to argue. I'm a great advocate. I am a great advocate. And if you have new information, I will absorb it. I will adjust my opinions according to new information. That's called reason. Um, but arguing and the problem with debates is it's usually like theater. It's not yeah, like that's true. Like when I was in law school and you would have like a real debate. Right. Like you would have an issue that could reasonably be either or and mm -hmm. you would have the pro and the con and you would be respectful and you would have an actual debate and people's minds could change from things like that because you're learning things that are both reasonable. But what we see for debates, that's not a debate. That's political right. theater. That's ridiculous nonsense. That's people come in, they decide who they think is going to win and they leave There's thinking like that's applause. one. <laughs> It's just, it's stupid. And so yeah. I don't want to, and, and a lot of things people want to debate to me are not debatable. I'm not debating healthcare with you. I'm not debate Like there's mm. just certain things like I don't want to. That's like, I might as well debate creationism or flat eartherism. And I just, I don't want to give credence to things that I think are not really valid that we know better now. Let's move on to things we haven't figured out yet. You know, that's sort of where I am, but I'll talk about anything with anybody. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay, I want to get one more question to you, Peter. This is something I ask everyone. If you had the opportunity, would you rather be president or advisor to the president? That's a tough question. Um, yeah, that's kind that of funny. Most when people we went back and forth as to who. When we first decided to do this in tw in twenty like nineteen, my thought was, "Why don't you run and I'll help you?" Like that was the original thought. So it's kind of funny that you say that. I guess yeah. it depends on what type of a president is in question. I don't need to be in the spotlight. I don't crave it. I can handle it, but it's not for everybody. Uh, the problem with being an advisor. He's is, better at it are, than I am. Are you an advisor that's listened to? Um, I'm sure that there are advisors that are around President Biden. There probably have been advisors that were around Trump and so forth that really had uh, the best intentions and really cared and wanted to see good things happen. And either they were ignored or pushed aside. And, you know, I have no problem being an advisor to the president, but Am I going to be an advisor who's just a token advisor or am I actually going to have an impact? So I think that if I you'll be chief of staff, baby. if I was an impact, then I would probably choose that position. But if I were to be the president um, again, <clears throat> I think the people that want to help and that really believe this country can end in the right direction, then you have to be willing to be JFK. Like you have to be willing to, to take that bullet. If you're not, then, you know, we're just going to continue to deteriorate as a, it's sad, but true. As a system. It's that's, sad, that's but true. Yeah, it's, it's a good answer. True. Yeah, and, and the truth is he could do either. Like, he could do either. Although, I don't know. I see you more as, like, liking to sort of be, like, behind the scenes and getting things done. I don't know. I see you as Last more guy like in the room. Last guy with the president's ear. That's how I always look at it. When I ask that question, I should almost say, do you want to be the president or the last guy in the room with the president? After he wants to be the last, last guy in the room. Asking. Yeah. Because yeah. I can, because my intentions are pure. My intentions right. are not self-serving. Yeah. And I think that that's the Well, mine are between. too, but he, we can't both be doing that same job. Well, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's like Trump having John Bolton or uh, Biden having Victoria right. Newland. Uh, like when you have people like that, you just have to know what their intentions are. Their intentions oh, are self-serving, full stop. And the worst person who ever got to the highest level was always Dick Cheney, which is uh, why I maintain that George Bush is without question despite the Trump derangement syndrome sufferers out there, George W. Bush is the worst president of my lifetime, and it's not close. I mean, the fact that our world kept itself together as a result of his and really Dick Cheney's presidency is unbelievable. And those are the, that, that's what happens when the wrong people get power. Yeah. Uh, if the right people get power, there's no telling what could happen. Um, but I do think our system has been set up at this point where it's almost impossible for the right people to get it. Well, and here's the other thing that's interesting, which people need to ponder. We actually had 
a show a couple years back with an author. His name is Brian Kloss, Kloss, K-L-A-A-S. And he wrote a book called Corruptible. And it has to do with like the type of people that go into, into politics. Are they are they a certain type of person that go into that or does it, the job kind of corrupt them? Just like talking, it, it's really very interesting stuff. And I think you see a lot of a certain personality type going into certain types of work, right? Like we see it with law enforcement. And one of the things is when, when you have a job where people get to put on riot gear and use military assault weapons and all this stuff, you're going to attract a certain type of person versus if you're law enforcement where you're old school detective and you're just covering the beat and you're, or you're solving crimes or you're meeting with the community or you're officer friendly, you're going to recruit a different kind of person. And I think that all jobs have that. And this job is not for everybody. You know, it really, I honestly, it's, I am like the reluctant reluctant political person because it is not for everybody. You, you have to have a small ego and very thick skin at the same time to do this and not be a psychopath. And that is something that, and I, I, I know that seems somewhat hyperbolic, but it's kind of true I because so. I, I, cause I see a lot of these people that are doing this and there is a psychopathy um, with people that get not just in leadership positions that seek leadership positions and then never want to pass the baton. Um, there's a psychopathy there, um, a narcissism, whatever, you know, whatever their different thing is. And so you don't find that many non like that people that would want to go and do this job and affiliate with psychopaths. And I got to tell you, that's why I've always said I'm like infinitely more prepared to lose than to win, because it's like that's daunting for someone like me to think of dealing with. Like there's times when we'll watch something in Congress and somebody will say something and I would be like, I don't think I'd be able to even keep a straight face. I do not think like somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene or someone will get up and say something. And I'm like, there is no way that I can take that seriously. I, I can't even have that. a serious conversation <laughs> with this person. I will start laughing. Like if I was sitting in a congressional hearing and Debbie Wasserman Schultz or someone like that opened up a fresh mouth like that to someone who's sitting there voluntarily, there's no way that I'm keeping a straight. Like, I, I don't understand how any, like, I got to tell you people, if, if we get there, it'll be most entertaining for you to watch because I will, I will wear a body cam and bring everybody along for the ride because I find this absurd that 535 people can't get their shit together enough so that we have clean water in this country no, or whatever. It's because we have a bought and paid for government. Yes. That's it. But so like, to and me, we, I can't take it seriously. Again, all you have to look at is somebody like Kirsten Cinema, who liberals are convinced is the reason why things didn't get right. done. It's, all her. Right. it's like, yeah, well now John Fetterman's going to play that role. Everything right. is just going to bounce off of somebody else. It's, it's always somebody political else's theater people until eventually you recognize that the reason why that is, is because Corporate power has been concentrated at such a level with a fleet of billionaires. And this is just a game. They're fine. And we're not. Yeah. yeah. So they're not going to be welcoming me with open arms there, Matt. I, I don't anticipate me hope. they're going to like me. <laughs> it gives me hope to see folks like you in the fight. And I'm so Good. grateful for your efforts. And I, I, you, you must be motivated, but you are definitely motivating. And, and I think that, um, I think no matter what happens, like I have faith in your campaign, but no matter what happens, I think you're going to inspire people. I think that's, that's the point. It's a big part of what, what we do. Right. So thank yeah. you for that. Look, I know you guys are all over the place. It's late. I know you've had a long day and a long night yeah. before I let my guests go. I always yeah. recommend a comic book to them or, I could tell you where you could go to see moose in this country. How do you know I want to see moose? You were following me about the moose. I watch I know all the shows. To go see That's the what moose. we do. Here. Oh, okay. I know where, where do you they go? are. Well, now I'm going to go up to northern Minnesota. I tried New Hampshire, and I know they are there. But now I'm going to try go, Voyager National Park is my next on my list. I go to Red Feather Lake above Fort Collins, Colorado, by really? like 30 minutes. Yeah. You okay, you know those I, are imported moose. Those are not real. Well, moose. what I'm, I do, I'm being moosest. <laughs> I'm going to be. Moosest. What I do know is you don't stop and talk to them or anything like that. But no, you can see but them. I'm going to tell you those are imported moose, 
And the import, and not really? that I'm against imported, yes. And I'm not opposed to imported moose. I fit all the power to them. I want to see natural moose in their natural place. And yes, they were not naturally in Colorado. Colorado brought them in because when I was in college there, they Why did not would have they? moose. I, well, to help populations and help breeding. And I'm sure there's a oh, logical okay. reason. But my point is, it's sort of cheating. Huh. And my husband was in Colorado and he's like, I saw a moose. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. There's not moose in Colorado. So I researched it and they imported the moose. And so I'm gonna I be, reject I'm gonna be imported back there. moose. I'm going to be back there soon. If anyone brings up the moose, I'm going to go imported. Not that <laughs> imported not that special, moose. turns out. And I am really joking. I'd be happy to see moose anywhere, but but um, I really the babies are cute. About, oh, I I love <laughs> all about the moose. When if you see them in northern Minnesota, you also can see the northern lights at the same place. Oh, there so you for go. me, it yeah. was like a twofer kind of kind of bucket list thing. That makes you know sense. I'm running yeah. out of years. I got to combine. I got to combine things. So it was like Northern <laughs> Lights cool. with Moose at, at, at Voyagers. Well, yeah. I I recommend comic books because we talk about that a lot here and a lot of yeah. people don't really read comic books and they think that they're just superheroes and stuff like that. So I've got one that I thought you might find interesting. <laughs> it's called yeah. Not the Israel My Parents Promised Me by Harvey P. Oh. Carr. It was, print, it was Harvey P. Carr, famous underground cartoonist from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he was raised by Zionist. He got to a certain point as a young adult where he was like, wait a second, this isn't right. And yeah. so it goes through his personal journey while also giving you the history of Israel and Palestine. Uh, it's very informative. It came out in like 2008, 2009. Unfortunately, very relevant right now, but also something that people can learn from if they are, for whatever reason, on the fence or maybe just misinformed or confused about that situation. And so I like to recommend it to you, but also the audience. So take that for what it's worth. Yeah. If you do read it, let me know. Uh, thank You'd you so much. You'd be surprised at how many comic books are in this room that I'm sitting in right now. Okay. You have no idea. So my you read comics a then? No, oh. my husband's a collector. He's been collecting since he's eight years old. We have offsite storage and he has recently <sighs> started online auctioning them and he's using the studio to do it. So like, the like, okay. trust me when I tell you, we got comics. Please got comics make sure I get the link to that auction. I am. He's he's Crime City Comics. Shout okay. out to Crime City Comics and um, him and yes and Code Blue Comics is his sort of like partner, his friend who does it too, and they do amazingly cool um, regular auctions that wow. they. I mean, they have spinny wheels. They give out prizes. They have a scotch of the night. They have a whole party online and. Um, <laughs> It's uh, Each it's side pretty... bonus here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Crime wild. City Comics, and my awesome. husband is also very, very knowledgeable about all things comics. Like, if you have questions, oh, great. how things are worth, what they're rated, he, they yeah, grading. So you might, you might have this laying around because it sounds like he at least knows who Harvey Picard would be. Um, I don't know. I'll ask. It's funny. One time, um, an editor suggested that Harvey K work with Harvey Picard. Did Professor that? Oh, Harvey, Harvey K. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happen, friends with Harvey K. Same. Yeah, it didn't yeah. happen, but the two Harveys it would have been great. Anyway, thank you so thank much you for so coming much. on the show. Is Absolutely. there anything? I'm like I said, we got plug. your links in the description. I think everyone's going to be able to find it. But is there anything you want to plug? Yeah. Before first you go, of all, uh, before we do go, uh, amazing drawing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nice. Sure. Thank you. That was cool. And no double chin. Thank so you. So if you guys are interested in supporting our campaign in whatever capacity you feel comfortable supporting us, uh, could be to volunteer, could be to donate, could be to spread the word. You can volunteer from anywhere. Anywhere. Make sure you go to gen2024.org. Every link is there to all of our social media pages. So if you want to make sure that you're following our YouTube channel, it's Generational Change with a J. Uh, but it obviously, like I said, it's going to take a city to get it done. But I do think Wasserman Schultz is vulnerable. I think that she can be knocked off. I think a lot of people are really sick of the system. And I think that a lot of people see her as the embodiment of what's been going in a very downward spiral for the past several years, especially in lieu of 2016. If we're ever going to put it to bed, I think this is our chance to do it. And I think if you have a fighter like Jen on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, it's not going to be one person who gets the job done, but it is somebody who could light the flame. And then many people can carry the torch. Um, thank you, Annie. Please send uh, an email to um, generationalchange at gmail.com and we can get you to come on the podcast. And that is our channel. 
uh, for anybody who would like to come on. That is oh. how just candidates, the, like, you know, letter, promote candidates. That's how the letter hack found us. And if anybody else is interested in having yeah. a conversation, we could do that. Uh, so yes, um, it really does mean a lot. Uh, any and all support really matters. Yeah. And that's why we're here late at night to try to spread the word. And also, cause I only had to put on makeup once today. Hey. So, took care of that. <laughs> he was win -win. So for that. Took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you again you for much. coming on. Nice to meet you. Yeah, Thanks, you man. as well. You guys are great. And I want to thank everyone for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.